the Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Hello and welcome to Short Circuit, your sometimes bi-weekly podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeal from the Institute for Justice's Center for Judicial Engagement. I'm your host, Diana Simpson, an attorney at IJ, and I am delighted to be joined today by two property law virtuosos. We have IJ senior attorney Bob McNamara, as well as special guest Robert H. Thomas, a director in the Honolulu firm of Damon Key Leong Kupchak Hastert and the Joseph T. Waldo Visiting Chair in Property Rights Law at William & Mary Law School in Virginia. Robert also authors the nation's premier blog on developments in property rights law at inversecondemnation.com, to which he is so dedicated that he blogged from the steps of the U.S. Supreme Court today after oral argument. As you might expect from that introduction, we have three big property rights cases coming at you today. We'll start with the discussion of a Virginia oyster business's war with wastewater. Robert? Well, thanks, and, and thank you both for welcoming me here to the mothership, seeing how you do business. That's wonderful. And thank you for the plug, yes. Um, inverse condemnation, we've been doing that for 15 years and love doing it. Um, the first case uh, is is one called Johnson against the city of Suffolk, and right now it's sitting in the uh, on the petition stage in the Virginia Supreme Court and involves – uh, oysters, as you said, in the Nansamond River, which is down in Hampton Roads in southern Virginia. And the plaintiffs in that case are uh, uh, oyster farmers. Uh, they own a lease from the state that gives them the exclusive right to harvest oysters in the river. Um, and then, of course, Virginia is very well known for its oysters and whatnot. Um, but that water has been polluted by the city of Suffolk and Hampton Road Sanitation District. And so the oystermen brought an inverse condemnation claim in Virginia state court, arguing that that was a taking and they needed to be compensated that for that both under the U.S. Constitution and the takings clause, but also under Virginia's taken or damaged clause in the Virginia Constitution. Um, and what happened was uh, they were subject to a demur or a motion to dismiss by uh, the defendants, the city and the sanitation district saying, well, that you failed to state a claim because you don't have any property rights in pollution-free oysters. Or put another way, we, the government, have a property or a right to pollute the river. Um, and that sounds like kind of a interesting way of approaching things these days. But they cited a 1919 U.S. Supreme Court case authored by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes called uh, Darling Against uh, the City of uh, Newport News. And in that case, uh, the court concluded um, a similar claim brought under – it wasn't the takings clause in that case, but it was the contracts clause. But the court concluded in a very short opinion that uh, uh, governments have the right to pollute the water. But in the key passage, the court based that argument on the then existing science was – that was uh, dumping sewage water into Hampton Roads – so it gets flushed out by the ocean, um, was the height of the science at the time. And that was the best that they could do. And they said, well, because we have to use it, use the waters for municipal sewage, then there's no property right to exclude that sewage from your oysters or from the, the property you lease. And so the property owners in this case argued two things. First of all, they said, we may have, we think we have better rights under the Virginia Constitution, which recognizes a greater property right than the Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment. Um, but also, um, if Darling does Im indeed apply to the case, well, then, you know, science has changed. We have things today like the Clean Water Act. Um, there's also uh, the public trust, uh, the, the common law public trust and whatnot that says that governments do not have a right to pollute the water. And when it does, we have to be compensated for that. Interesting. Bob, do you think you could give a one-sentence snippet as to what inverse condemnation is? Of course. Inverse condemnation is Robert Thomas's blog. Um, and it is also a, a lawsuit filed by a property owner against the government asserting that essentially whatever the government has done amounts to a taking of my property. The government should have used eminent domain to just take my property. And so I'm going to sue essentially to force the government to use eminent domain and to compensate me for the thing it has taken. 
Uh, and the argument here is that the pollution is so thorough and so damaging to these guys' interest in the oysters that they've effectively taken the oysters away. If you really need to dump your waste in this water here, you're effectively taking away our oysters, and the only way the government can take property is to buy it. So the lawsuit's saying, you've taken our oysters, now pay us for what you've purchased. And this is really an area where I think it gets to fundamental notions of what property is in a way that all too often the case law just kind of glides over. Like fundamentally, this is, I think Robert's correct, it's about how we conceive of the commons. Uh, and I think there was a, a strong notion uh, in the early 20th century that the commons were uh, sort of what was owned by the entire public and the entire public was the government and therefore the government standing in essentially just had dominion over anything held in common. And I think there's a real question of whether the both the equation of the government with the public uh, and the the logical inference that that means that the government can do whatever it wants with these areas are th there are certainly things that have been undermined by uh, certainly by statutory developments, but also just by I think common law developments in the states and in the federal courts recognizing that uh, there is. A difference between property that the government holds title to, government is actual landowner, and then property that is actually held in common, uh, property that isn't titled to anyone like, say, rivers. So, Robert, because you guys are the ones petitioning for review here, I um, assume that that means that the courts below did not rule in the oystermen's favor. Um, uh, can you describe the, the, that decision a little bit? Yeah, that's correct. Um, and, and just for clarity, um, this start. This is in the Circuit Court of uh, Virginia, and the the court in that case granted, or I'm sorry, sustained the demur. I'm thinking in my you know, motion to dismiss, but it's the same thing. Sustain the demur uh, only on the basis that uh, the uh, property owners did not have that property interest uh, that Bob was talking about. But interestingly enough. Um, ruled in favor of the property owners on some other arguments. Um, the first being that this was, I mean, interestingly enough, because you, you mentioned it's an in inverse condemnation, uh, the, the term that the, the, the sanitation district actually uses is the oysters are condemned for a certain period of time. Um, and you might think that that would trigger their obligation to pay at that point, pay just compensation. Um, but they said, no, that's just simply the time we're declaring. There's certain months of the year that they can't harvest the oysters because the pollution levels are too high. And that's the condemnation period. So, but uh, the, the, the just compensation they think is owing for that is nothing for exactly the reasons that Bob mentioned, is that uh, uh, the nature of the property at, int at, at issue. But first, the, the court uh, disagreed with their argument. Uh, there's a statute in Virginia that says municipalities cannot condemn oysters. Well, that seemed maybe to have solved the problem. They said, we're not, we didn't condemn, we can't condemn these oysters, so therefore we don't have the power to condemn them, therefore we can't be liable in inverse condemnation. And the court uh, below correctly, I think, um, said, no, that doesn't matter. It, we know you weren't condemning the oysters, you didn't intend to, but when it ends in inverse condemnation by its very nature is you're exercising some other power that results in the effective the effective result of that is a taking, and if that's the case, you've taken property. In fact, you have an obligation whether you think you were taking it or whether you even had the power to take that property. So um, that, I think, was a very important ruling and one that actually went in the landowner's favor. So the, the issue now on appeal, um, y there is no intermediate court in these areas in Virginia. It goes straight from circuit court, and then you ask the... Virginia Supreme Court for a discretionary review, and that's the stage that the case is at now. But it really does go back to those idea of the commons, and um, I think this case is especially important to follow because it gets into those fundamental issues of ownership of property, both from the property owner side. What, what did they own in their oysters? What did that state lease give to them? Or, or what did they get by virtue of the state lease and the right to harvest oysters? And conversely, um, the state as the trustee of the public trust, 
what obligations does that have uh, as their ownership? Does that, as indeed the state argued, or not the state, I'm sorry, the city argued, does that give them the right to pollute? And I don't know about you, but I'm standing up, and I'm the government's attorney, and I'm standing up before the Virginia Supreme Court. I'm going to find it very difficult uh, to, you know, come out, pound the lectern and say, Your Honor, the government has a right to pollute the water. Um, that's going to be a very, very difficult argument, I think, to make. Maybe not legally, if Darling is indeed still good law, but just from, you know, there's certain arguments that you know when you make on a, you know, in a court that's going to unleash a bombardment of questions and uh, scathing comments from the bench. And that, I, I would guess, is going to be one of them. All right. Thank you. Uh, we will now head out west for an old-fashioned land grab. Longtime listeners might recognize this case from our discussion back in 2017 when the Colorado Court of Appeals issued a good decision limiting eminent domain. The case has aged a bit since then, but not like a fine Bordeaux. Bob, why don't you fill us in? So for the, uh, the few of you who do not religiously follow Short Circuit and cannot immediately recall the 2017 discussion, um, I, I get emails, people listen religiously. Um, so this case is about uh, a unique creation of Colorado law of what's called a municipal district. And what happened in this case is a property developer called Century Communities wanted to build a new development in the county of Parker in Colorado. And so they went to the nearby town, which was also called Parker, things get confusing, and uh, and asked, if we build this, will you incorporate us into your town of Parker? And the town of Parker said, uh, we will. This this isn't dense enough. You own two parcels of land. If you can acquire this third parcel of land and build something that meets our density requirements, we'll incorporate you into the town and you can be part of the town. And the difficulty was that Century didn't own this third piece of land. And so they said to the town of Parker, hey, how about you guys use your power of eminent domain and take this land so that we can meet our obligation to meet your density requirements? And the town of Parker said, no, we, we don't do that. Uh, a city councilman actually said, we don't do eminent domain, uh, which is a, a sentence that endears that guy to me forever. Uh, but it turns out in Colorado, you don't need the government to do eminent domain. Uh, in Colorado, uh, you can create what's called a special municipal district. And a municipal district is uh, sort of a, a built-for-purpose government entity. And anyone you can create whatever boundaries you want, and anyone who owns land in the municipal district or lives in the municipal district gets to vote on what the municipal district is going to do with its governmental powers. And so Century drew up a municipal district that uh, comprised three undeveloped parcels of land, the two that it owned, and then the third that it needed. Uh, and then it used its own voting rights as a landowner of two of the three parcels to vote on whether the municipal district should use eminent domain to take the third parcel of land so that Century could fulfill its obligations to the town of Parker. And in a shocking twist, it won the vote. Uh, it voted in favor of itself uh, and against the third person. Um, and what the mid-level Court of Appeals said in Colorado was that this isn't okay. Uh, you can't use eminent domain just so a private developer can meet its contractual obligations to the town of Parker. Uh, the Colorado Supreme Court reversed, saying this is absolutely okay. Uh, because what this land was actually going to be used for, the third parcel, was going to be roads and utilities and things the development needed, things that were classic public uses. And the Colorado Supreme Court said, no, no, no. All we care about is whether the use looks like a traditional public use. And if it's a road, that's the end of the inquiry. And it doesn't matter that what actually happened here is a private corporation built its own government and then used its own government for its own ends. What matters is what they say they're going to build. Uh, this this is the part where I should probably disclose that I think this is wrong. Uh, and in fact, we at IJ have taken over the case and are petitioning the U.S. Supreme Court for certiorari uh, to look at this question of whether, in fact, it matters why the government is doing what it's doing. And the when you look at the Colorado Supreme Court opinion, it, it seems almost angry uh, that this practice is being questioned. Uh, it seems a little affronted, uh, in part perhaps because IJ came in and filed an amicus brief making the case that this was you know, insane. Uh, but the Colorado Supreme Court just seems to say this is the way it works in Colorado. You can create a special municipal district and you can control the special municipal district. And this is just what developers do. And I think that's a kind of a dangerously blasé way of thinking about this. Like if all that matters when the government uses eminent domain is whether it's building a road, uh, 
that seems to open its do- open the door to things that almost all of us would acknowledge our abuses. Like It's certainly possible that the government is building a road because it needs a road. It's also possible that the government is building a road here because the road goes right through my bicycle repair shop, and my bicycle repair shop competes with the mayor's bicycle repair shop, and so that's why the road goes through my building. That seems like something most of us would say courts should inquire into, and that's exactly what the Colorado Supreme Court seems to say just isn't a question, isn't a question courts get to ask. Uh, So I I think that's wrong. I think that's dangerous. And it actually goes directly into uh, an existing split of authority about exactly how you look at this question and whether the only thing that matters uh, is is that you're building a road, which I I know is an issue that that Robert has litigated directly and has, has helped build that circuit split for us. Yeah, what I found interesting, especially about this case, was the way you framed the petition and the question presented. Um, what I mean, maybe I can ask you the question because I think the answer to it is quite telling. Is you say the Colorado Supreme Court violated a Supreme Court case? What was that case? They actually violated the rule of Kilo v. New London, <laughs> which cracks me up. That that you you Institute for Justice of all people would be saying this case is so bad it even violates Kilo. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think the lesson is there's nowhere you can set the bar of constitutional review that a governmental entity will not try to crawl under it. Yes, exactly. We thought the bar in Kilo was already at the floor, but apparently it's even lower. And what I found also interesting about this was uh, that the court said, well, whatever use they may or may not do with it in the future, it matters what they say they will do in the future – and you can't question – as long as that use is you know, maybe this classic public use, uh, roads, streets, you know, why can't they just say a post office no matter what they eventually end up doing it or what their real intent in doing that was? As long as they say these magic words, all of a sudden the courts lose all power to take a look at this thing and try to peek behind the curtain as, as exactly as you point out that even Kilo says in certain circumstances not presented in that case – the government or, or the court does get to look, has an obligation to look behind the curtain against these – these um, uh, the stated use, even if it's a classic use, to see if that use is a pretext to something else. You know, in this case, well, again, the two – you know, the, what is that old phrase? The two wolves and the lamb agreeing what's for lunch, right? No, and I think it, it really illustrates – a, a persistent problem in how we we talk about deference and judicial deference uh, that throughout the Colorado opinion is this idea that we have to defer to what the condemnor is saying. They're saying they're going to build a road. We owe deference to the legislature. And this also is throughout the majority opinion in Kilo that, oh, the new London Development Corporation had this entire plan and we have to defer to their process and defer to their planning and defer to their exercise of eminent domain. And what the Carousel Farms case puts into stark relief for me is just the question of to whom we are deferring. I mean, the the only actual governmental official, the only person anybody voted for who had anything to say about this was the guy in the town of Parker who said, we don't do eminent domain. Uh, And oddly, we're not deferring to him. We're deferring to a a quasi-governmental entity that is explicitly and expressly controlled, not just influenced by, not lobbied by, controlled by a private corporation, but we have to to defer to them. And at a certain point, you just get into this never-ending spiral of deference, uh, which just takes the courts out of the game. And it seems like we, we have courts for a reason. Uh, and ultimately, we have to decide what the point of deference is. is. Is the point of deference to respect the legislative process, or is the point of deference to make sure that courts don't actually decide individual rights cases? Um, I It seems like the, the decision we see out of the Colorado Supreme Court very much leans towards the second, and I just I don't know what the justification for that position is. Uh, if you accept that there are any limits on the eminent domain power at all. Right. And, you know, even in Kilo, the majority opinion seemed to base or or based its deference, saying that this isn't any different, say, than Berman or Midkiff, um, because we trust the process. And then, of course, the majority opinion lays out years and years of supposed process by these governmental agencies. And one might think that, well, if you weren't satisfied with those landowners of, of New London, 
vote the bums out. I'm not exactly sure how the landowner in this case uh, would vote the bums out uh, when it's not even a government at stake in this, that's doing the taking at this, in, in this case. In fairness, you, you couldn't vote out the new London Development Corporation that's either. That's true. I, that is true. But, you but know, I take your point. And it's there, yeah. it seems like there's always one more step to go. Yes. Uh, that this, this is almost the government, so we're going to defer to it. And yes. this is almost the government, so we're going to defer to it. And granted, this is literally just one private corporation, but we've come so far already. Why not defer to them too? Now, is there any, I mean, maybe I can ask a question. Is there any even indirect control from elected officials over this municipal, whatever this thing is? There is not. There's one check on municipal district power in the state of Colorado. And that's, uh, so the, the votes have to be exercised by individual human beings. And so what corporations do and what Century did is they appoint their own employees uh, to these boards. They give their employees sham option contracts uh, that make them landowners that say, oh, you, you have the option to buy the land from your employer and therefore now you can sit on the board. Uh, and if you sit on the board, uh, Colorado law requires you to disclose if you have a conflict of interest. And so in this case, the board members on the, the actual municipal district board followed the law and they disclosed that they had a conflict of interest because they were employees of the developer. And do you know what Colorado law requires to happen after someone discloses a conflict of interest? Nothing. Nothing happens. They have to publicly say they have a conflict of interest and then they continue to exercise their power unchecked. So this is terrifying. Um, do any other states have anything like this municipal district power? I have not been able to find another state that allows special districts like this to be created, controlled by individual private entities, and to use the power of eminent domain. Uh, so this isn't just a, a tax overlay district. This literally lets someone draw the boundaries of uh, a bunch of land they like, and as long as they own 51% of the land, they can take the other 49% for themselves. And as far as I can tell, that happens in Colorado, and it happens in Colorado exclusively. So if Colorado is the only one doing this, why does it matter? It matters because fundamentally this is a question about who gets to be in charge of deciding whether eminent domain can be used. And this question comes up in state high courts all across the country, not with this kind of unique municipal district system that Colorado has created, uh, but in Issues where the condemnor actually is the government, but there's still a, a strong argument that what's going on is a pretext. The government may say it's building a road, but if you look at the maps, it's not building a road. It's building a private driveway. And the courts get to ask that question. In some states, they can ask that question. In some states, they can't ask that question. And frankly, I don't think anyone really has a, a solid answer on what the courts are supposed to do here. Right now, the answer is it depends on where you live, what your rights are, and that's not supposed to be the way the Constitution works. Yeah, that's it exactly. I mean, there is a pretty deep split among the local courts or, or the uh, w about what to do. Um, to what degree does the court have to defer to these statements about uh, this is the reason that we are taking property that looks ostensibly public, and yet there is some evidence uh, that the benefit is is not entirely public. And so there's a uh, I think it's it's one of those that since Kilo has been really crying out for some input from the court, but it's been what fifteen years since Kilo. And uh, uh, I know those of us in the property bar have been, arguing ever since Kilo that we need clarification for what's next. You told us this is Kilo wasn't the case. Well, maybe this one is it. All right. Well, for the last case today, we have a special treat for you in a day full of special treats. We are going abroad. Robert, take us away to the Philippines Supreme Court. Well, this is one that I, I call Berman, Berman versus Parker International, or maybe Midkiff uh, against the Hawaii Housing Authority International, because it involves the city of Manila on one side and a group of private owners on the other. And this is a case that, boy, if we got this decision out of the U.S. Supreme Court, I think all of us here today would be very happy, because... Um, 
this started off with uh, what's uh, the reason I say it's the sort of the the midkiff writ writ international was the Philippines has a program called the Land for the Landless. And because of its of the economy in in um, the Philippines, this program, what it will do, it's an express government program to take blighted property through the power, what they call expropriation or eminent domain. So again, something that looks very familiar to us. And through the expropriation power, take the property from the owners who are using it in a way that's blighted, and then transferring that to people who have, you know, at the lowest rungs of the economic ladder in the Philippines, another land for the landless. Um, and uh, the statute itself sets out a series of, of prerequisites, one of which it has to be under, not just underutilized, but actually blighted, dilapidated. And you look at it, and again, it would be familiar to us uh, reading the statute here in the United States. Um, these all look like your classic cases of blight and whatnot. And so in this case, uh, property was taken from the landed and was going to be transferred to the landless. And the property owners in this case alleged that, wait a minute, our property doesn't qualify under blight. We're using our property in a good way. It may not be the highest and best use of the property, but it is certainly not blighted. So again, it reminds us of Berman against Parker just here over the river and uh, cases that have come out of, of the New York Court of Appeals and other places in the last 10 or 15 years. And what's, uh, uh, again, the, the process that they use there, very much like ours, at least it's quite familiar because, uh, as I understand the Philippine legal system, it's a mix of the civil law from the Spanish background and then, of course, a strong common law tradition from the time that it was, uh, uh, I don't believe it was a territory of the United States, but we, a colony, I don't know, know quite what, but they had a, the, uh, uh, the Philippines had a relationship with the United States such that the, the common law tradition is quite strong there. And so a challenge was brought by those property owners saying this is unconstitutional under our expropriation clause, which looks a lot like our public use clause in the U.S. Constitution. And the, uh, the taking was sustained in the trial court. Uh, the property owners then appealed to the Court of Appeals and won there. The court said, well, you know, I'm going to look behind the curtain. Um, as, is, as the statute and the Constitution of the Philippines gives us the right as judges to do and said, well, this property really isn't blighted, so it can't be taken. At which point uh, the city of Manila petitioned for certiorari and uh, the court granted it and reviewed the case and affirmed the Court of Appeals. And so if you read the very short opinion, um, uh, uh, it, it's something that for us as, as American lawyers would, one, find very familiar, and two, I think those of us on the property rights side of things would really like the way the court sets it out. And w the court took the case apparently to not only affirm the judgment of the Court of Appeals, but to take the rationale which was limited to the statute in the Court of Appeals decision and expand it into a constitutional doctrine based upon property rights. So reading between the lines a bit and, you know, disclosure, I'm not a I'm not barred in the Philippines, so I may be wrong about this, but I was reading between the lines where the court said not only uh, did this violate the statutory the statutory definitions of blight, but Courts have an obligation where private property is involved, a sacrosanct right under our, the Philippine Constitution, to look behind the curtain and ask those questions because to take someone's property away from them by the force of the government is among the most extreme violations of someone's civil rights that a government can do intentionally. And I thought that language was just wonderful, and I'm, you know, I know it's not precedent in the courts of Hawaii and California and in the federal courts here, but I'm citing this case. No, I mean, I, I know absolutely nothing about the Filipino legal system, uh, but I, I do think this really illustrated for me what's, I guess, emerging as a theme of our podcast, that it's, it's very common when we talk about the law, I think, to focus on the substance uh, like does does the property have to be dilapidated or does it have to be deteriorated? And we fight a lot about language, but at bottom, what a lot of this comes down to is not the question of the substantive rule, but the question of who decides. 
Whatever the standard is, whatever we're going to say blighted means, who gets to decide whether the property is blighted? Is it the executive that wants to take the property uh, and perhaps has self-interested reasons and to, to engage in some motivated reasoning about whether it meets the standard? Or is there going to be an independent arbiter? And that question of who decides who gets to look behind the curtain or sometimes just in front of the curtain, who gets to look at all, is fundamentally what drives a lot of these fights in constitutional law here in the States and, and apparently in the Philippines as well. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, um, the question of whether the courts have any role, and if you read that Colorado uh, Supreme Court decision, um, uh, the, 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 the courts apparently have no role, absolutely, in looking at, at what this is. Did you cross off certain T's and dot certain I's? And at that point, you know, it, 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 you know I, I think back to that old Phil Hartman sketch where he's the unfrozen caveman lawyer, right? The, I call them unfrozen caveman judges because they say, oh, your world of eminent domain just frightens me and I don't know what to do about it. And they, they said, "What? so whatever, whatever you say goes. And I'm not sure I can think of any other area of law where they, the courts have taken such a hands-off position on reviewing the decisions of other branches. Well, there I, is I the can rational think of a basis few. test. <laughs> yes. yeah, right. we, we litigate several of yes, them here. Yes, you know, what protestants. I like to call the aliens might have done it, uh, you know, <laughs> as the Ninth Circuit argument uh, kind of infamously said that, right, if, if, if it's conceivable that Congress passed the law because invisible aliens are walking among us, uh, ask, ask the U.S. attorney, does that mean rational basis review, you win? And he said, yes, Your Honor, and guess what? They won that case. So I, I call it aliens might have done it review, right? I but laugh, but it's true. It is. Okay, well, that concludes today's show. Head on over to Twitter where you can find Robert at at INV Condemnation and me at Diana K. Simpson. As for Bob, well, you can look for him, but you won't find him. Thanks for listening, and until next time, this is Diana Simpson from the Institute for Justice urging you, like your great uncle always does, to get engaged. Mm-hmm.